You mentioned uh, the d discussion about the effectiveness of particular projects, and I wanted to ask a little bit about uh, Oxfam's evaluation and monitoring. Uh, we're going to be talking in this course with uh, people from GiveWell who have been evaluating particular charities, um, and Oxfam is not one of GiveWell's recommended top charities. I know you've had some contact with them and some discussion with them, so I wanted to give you a chance to say uh, what you think of the way they evaluate and uh, what you think you're able to do in terms of evaluation, how you, how you would try to demonstrate to somebody that even if GiveWell has not recommended you as one of their top charities, you would still see what you're doing as being highly effective. Um, well, the first thing I'd say is I think we're in a very interesting moment in this entire field of, of, um, uh, of philanthropy and development, both domestically and, and internationally, because I think what's one of the things that's going on is we're in the midst of what I guess I call a, an accountability revolution in which organizations, not-for-profits, both you know, um, from donor countries as well as in, in uh, many of the countries where we work, are being challenged to demonstrate the impact of the work that they do in, um, in meaningful ways. And I think that's a good thing. And, um, and I think the challenge to organizations, however, is, uh, is to now invest in delivering answers to many of those tough questions. One of the problems in our sector has been historically we've been underinvested in that, that in that function, and even our donors have un, have actually underinvested in that function historically. So while they demand the outcome, they don't necessarily invest invest in enabling it to happen. Although I think that's probably changing as we go forward. But um, in our particular case, we we embrace the accountability revolution with the idea that we did not want to be simply compliant, but we wanted to be an industry leader. And we've introduced uh, uh, recognizing that we're, we're implementing, I guess, what you might call a somewhat unique approach, as you said at the beginning, a rights-based approach to development, an approach in which, for our long-term development programs, we're establishing baselines, we're doing um, mid-course evaluations, we're doing annual impact reviews, and then every, pro every pro project um, is embedded in a program, and we're doing, um, if you will, summary program reviews um, for multi-year pr programs that uh, we're implementing over time. In our humanitarian work, which is very fast moving and requires a different kind of an approach, uh, it's hard to establish a baseline um, because of the, you know, you're, you're going into a very chaotic situation, although a lot of the baseline is about the mortality rates that may be occurring in a particular setting that you're trying to address and or uh, mitigate. Uh, in those cases, we do real-time uh, evaluations on the ground that actually enable us to make course corrections in the kind of services we're providing in the humanitarian environments. And then again, we're doing in-depth reviews at the end of um, these events to determine, did we respond fast enough? Did we meet the global standards for good performance? Uh, are there particular things we're learning from these events that actually need to be incorporated into our work planning for the future? One example, um, recently is our response to Ebola. This response to pandemics is not something that not-for-profits have historically done in the humanitarian space and Ebola presented us with enormous challenges where the kinds of things that we would historically do in a refugee camp did not apply to kind of a highly dispersed pandemic outbreak and the normal kinds of things we would do in a public health um, delivery system of providing water and sanitation to mitigate disease outbreaks did not apply or they, they were important, but not in the same way that they would be in a refugee camp. What we found ourselves doing was actually patient identification um, and having to organize teams to go out and do patient identification, uh, something that was we hadn't imagined ourselves doing. Um, so this is, has caused us to actually, in our evaluative process, to ask ourselves, are we prepared for, for pandemic outbreaks in the future? And we think they actually could be part of our future um, in today's world. And so we've incorporated that as a, um, uh, as a new learning initiative within the uh, humanitarian unit as a consequence of the evaluative work that we've done. The toughest part of our work is actually evaluating our advocacy work and our campaigns work, which you know, I've talked about uh, earlier in the conversation. And one of the things that I think groups like GiveWell have found challenging uh, in that area is it doesn't lend itself to traditional um, mathematical or quantitative uh, evaluative techniques. 
in many ways, it's a, an approach in which you have a, maybe a legislative target or a policy change target or a, uh, an approach to a corporation where you're trying to change behaviors and, and, and corporate business practices. And there is a critical path you have to follow that has a whole set of intermediate victories that some of which you can identify and some of which may be difficult to identify, but you achieve them along the way. And you have to constantly make course corrections. And um, so planning that kind of work and establishing baselines are a lot tougher and, and different and less mathematically, uh, less susceptible to mathematical um, calculation than the, the traditional service delivery of where we might be vaccinating children or we might be you know, um, building a school and trying to get, you know, um, educational attendance. Right, so they're, they're clear criteria and I guess you can do uh, really even randomized trials of you do this in some villages and not others and you see what the, the differences are. I think uh, it's easy to understand that the advocacy work is not going to be susceptible to that kind of testing. But still somewhere in the organization and presumably the buck stops with you, um, decisions have to be made in terms of of budget. Um, how much of your budget do you decide to allocate to advocacy? How much to humanitarian relief work? Uh, and how much to other kinds of, of traditional, more traditional development like, uh, as you mentioned, uh, helping farmers to grow rice better or something of that sort. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious as to how that decision actually gets made if the, these things are all rather different. Uh, as you say, some of them you can get quite good comparisons of, of what the difference you make here is and what the benefits are at a certain cost, others you can't. Um, what, what, can you say anything about that process? Of yeah, well, basically Oxfam has three basic uh, areas of activity. One is our humanitarian response capability, the other is our long-term development work, and the third is our advocacy and campaigning work. And in the humanitarian work, basically our criteria for that is we need to have a basic set of core competencies and deployable staff for humanitarian emergencies. Uh, and so, and we've figured out what we need to contribute to the work of the, our global confederation in that particular area. We know what that core is, um, and so we establish the budget, budget based on that, you know, knowing what that core set of competencies is, is. Now what happens in humanitarian emergencies, when the emergencies occur, we will get large tranches of money coming in to support the emergency. We would hire new staff. We would deploy people to the field and hire local staff in the field to build out a large team in responding to a major emergency. So, so you actually are growing your own budget by growing your revenue because you're responding and you're exactly. seen to be responding to this particular emergency. So, so in Haiti, we might have 700 staff, but we might only have 25 or 30 expatriate experts, and the rest are all going to be Haitians, mm -hmm. who are, you know, who, who are, you know, some of whom would be specialists in public health. And other air, and, and then we would train other people in some of the subset issues that we have to, we that we need to address in managing large refugee camp settlements or um, in dealing with water and sanitation issues at a very very local or micro level, and we're accustomed to doing that in all sorts of settings all over the world. So in some sense, this is an area that expands and contracts based on on need and availability of funding. The area where we have to be more careful is in the work that we do at the country level, where we set where we're developing new programs and we're actually trying to keep um, a sufficient amount of money of, uh, that we get from donors on a restricted basis for developing the kinds of programs we've been talking about. Let's say a weather indexed insurance program in, in let's say Ethiopia might have a, you know, a foundation supporting it, might have a major corporation like Swiss Re supporting it, and we would put in some unrestricted money and we would get that program going and support it on a multi-year basis. Um, and we'd have to make commitments that that program, based on the evaluations that we've done, actually merits ongoing support going forward. So we're, in some sense, we're a social investor in the sense that we've got to, we've got to test new ideas, and if they're proving to be successful, continue to support them modestly as we're doing proof of case, and then look for more money for expansion. But in many cases, in that long-term development work, we're assuming we are not going to do the scale-up. So just to take that weather index uh, insurance program, We've taken that to the point where we've got proof of case in Ethiopia. We've partnered with the World Food Program now, and they're taking it to other areas of Ethiopia, but they're also taking it to Mali and Senegal, and perhaps Zambia and Malawi in the future, uh, in which we'll be providing a little bit of the technical support for the implementation of it, but they're going to do the scale-up. So we're not presuming that we're going to be the big service provider on the scale-up portion of that initiative. So that enables us to be very strategic in the way we're putting our money toward those issues without necessarily assuming we need large tranches of money for the scale-up. 
In the advocacy area, I think we're presuming that it's a complement to our field-based work, so we never imagine it being something that would dwarf our long-term development work, and on average, it's been probably a quarter in terms of scale of our, you know, our overall development work overseas. Um, and that goes toward our presence in Washington, D.C. As a, as, a, uh, as a policy presence to the kind of research, policy research we need to do to back our ideas and to building a national constituency here in the United States of people who actually are interested in international development and, and the policy issues that we represent. Okay. Um, well, I think I've covered the issues that were on my mind, and I wonder whether in closing there's anything that you want to say to people who are taking this course and are thinking about uh, altruism and acting altruistically and being effective with regard to that. Is, is there, are there any final thoughts you'd like to leave them with? Well, I think maybe I'll, I, I'll go back to where I started, which I think this, this question of, you know, what is poverty is, is something that's been debated for a very, very long time. And I think, um, you know, I would challenge maybe your viewers to actually think a little bit about this dichotomy between the idea of poverty is the absence of, of public goods and our need to address those. And there is a place for altruism and there's a place for ad addressing immediate needs. But I challenge people to actually think a little bit more about root causes and the fact that maybe we can address the poverty problem in a very challenging way if we're thinking about um, poverty as social exclusion and thinking about what are those barriers that limit the ability of poor people to actually work their way out of uh, of their poverty circumstance. And when you begin to look at poverty in those terms, you begin to see what the barriers are, what the obstacles are, and what kinds of changes in terms of policy and practice of institutions uh, are needed to actually get at root causes. And um, it's a different path to, a, to an outcome that maybe yield, may yield more benefit for more people than um, the limited projects that we oftentimes think of as the best quality work. Those are very satisfying, they're very gratifying, they're needed, but maybe it's time for us to look at root causes and think about the poverty challenge in a somewhat different way. And then we have to think about how we can change those root causes, of course. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Right. Okay, thanks very much for talking with us, Ray. Thank you, right. Peter. It's been a pleasure.